Welcome to Courtney on Health, brought to you on MalcolmPresents.com and other venues, which we should enumerate later. We'll enumerate? Yeah, later. Sure. Anyway, sure. welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Anyway. So, hi, 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 Courtney, and hi, Malcolm. Uh, again, welcome to Courtney on Health, a Zoomcast and podcast series about how to get through these lingering COVID times. Every time I say that, I still shake my head. With tips on nutrition and exercise given by Courtney Gravenese, registered dietitian with a Master of Science degree in nutrition and applied physiology. Just for, for, your, for your information, before I cut you off, I've signed up for my uh, fourth shot, booster shot. Oh, okay. Good for you. No, you actually, we're going to go it. with my wife and, my, uh, and her mother. Okay. Uh, so let me know how it goes. Up. But we get a discount for three shots. Oh, yeah. Two for three. Anyway, hey. that was a complete off the cuff thing uh, the, in the middle of an introduction. Uh, Got to wait till the end of that. Uh, <laughs> Courtney is an experienced nutritional and health consultant in the New York metro area and beyond and will help guide you on a path to wellness and health. And if anyone is thinking about a fourth shot, check out the CDC guidelines. And if you are eligible, do, do what you think you need to do. That's all I'll say about that. Yeah, so thing you have to remember that what I do is completely off the cuff ad lib. Mainly what you do is ad lib. The only one that knows what the hell she's talking about is Courtney. <laughs> okay. And that's the important one. Thanks for so, reeling it in to see it's yeah. appropriate. You get this. Right. We're reeling in, we're reeling you in to make sure you give us the right info. And it's a, it's a fishy subject. And so here is the poem, which is appropriately called Fishy by Amy L. V. No last name. I took a sip of water from a glass on the table, but it tasted funny. Something tasted weird. I held the glass up higher to see what was the matter when in between my fingers, a tiny fish appeared. I set it on the table and let the water settle. I watched them swim in a circle. My confusion slowly cleared. I hollered, where's the fish tank? I heard, it's really dirty. The fish is on the table just as I feared. Good luck with all that. So I used to love to watch the tropical fish swim around my brother Mitch's 100-gallon fish tank. He had an incredibly gorgeous fish tank. And he took great care of its occupants, and I never saw him put a fish on the table while cleaning the tank. Uh, it's very zen to watch fish glide through the water and hide inside the rocks. As a matter of fact, it's really quite cathartic. So aside from looking at fish, we know that eating fish, <laughs> that's a good segue, uh, as a part of your diet is a healthy option. Fish contains omega-3s, which can help reduce the risk of developing cardiovascular disease, cancer, inflammatory disorders, and even mental and emotional problems. There are things to know about choosing fish and seafood so that what you pick is most sustainable. Is it wild? Is it farmed? Uh, what is the difference and why does that matter? Uh, Courtney will give us great info on how to choose the most sustainable fish and seafood and which types are best for your health. So here we go. Courtney, can you bring us in on this fishy topic? Absolutely. Hello to both of you. So yeah, why don't we start by the health benefits of eating fish if you choose to eat fish. It is, even if you're not, on a coastal part of the world, wherever you live. It's a popular thing to eat and with good reason, excellent source of protein. It can be high in omega-3 fatty acids like we have here, the salmon that's here, fatty fish like anchovies, um, certain tuna, um, sardines, but you don't have to be choking down only those um, seafood products that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. That's just one component of uh, seafood that makes it a great protein option. The other side, like we said, is the mineral content, the protein content. Um, and in some cases, it's an extremely economical option for you know, meeting your protein needs. So it, you know, we, we really have to, if you're open to it, you like the taste of it, and I get it if you've got small kiddos 
um, and they're not used to growing up with different types of fish and shellfish. So let's just back step for a second. So seafood umbrellas, both fish. So think about trout, um, salmon, and then shellfish. So think about um, you know, clams, oysters, lobster in that category. So it's underneath the bigger umbrella of overall seafood. So depending on your taste preferences, depending on your budget, um, and depending on where, you know, what's available in your local store will really drive what type of seafood you may want to put, you know, on the table. And we're definitely going to get into wild versus versus farmed. Um, so do you, I know Sam and uh, uh, Malcolm, you're a big fan of sushi, you said. Yeah. So, you know, I know some people who make their own sushi. I, from my perspective, which I think is great. It's amazing. But, you know, sushi, sushi, ah, say that 10 times, sushi chefs really know what they're doing in terms of the quality of the fish that they're getting, how clean their knives are, how quickly that fish moves from refrigeration to counter to plate to reduce um, any potential risk of bacterial contamination. Well, so um, so many things, uh, at, at a sushi bar, there's an, a good sushi chef, there's an art the way he, he, he oh, works yeah. with his hands and his knife is, is poetic. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. I'm completely with you on that. So, but sushi for some people is expensive. Um, what's important to know is that we tend to put our noses up to canned foods, I will say. Uh, it's, it's sad because I think it can be a great option for many people and an economical option. So please don't turn your nose up when it comes to things like canned tuna fish, canned salmon, um, any of the tinned um, fish that we just mentioned, like the anchovies and the sardines. Price per you know, nutrient quality and bang for your buck is really, really high. So please don't rule that out simply because it's in a can. In many cases, it's one of the only ways for folks to have access to seafood, that great quality protein and potentially omega-3 fatty acids um, with, without you know, breaking the bank. So absolutely consider um, some of these options. The next in line would be, and I'm finding this all over now, would be fro frozen. So you buy it in like sort of family packs, but don't let that scare you. If you're a family of one, you still buy it. The beauty of it is it's individually sealed. Um, so it can bring the price down uh, considerably and then you defrost what you need. So we reduce the waste. So absolutely consider um, these family pack options. I'm seeing them all over. This just happens to be Whole Foods 365 brand, um, but um, they definitely are a way to get your seafood intake up if it's something you're trying to do and do it within budget. And in the case of something like Whole Foods, and they're not the only market out there, um, they really do um, only sell products that meet their standards of sustainability. And we'll talk about that um, in a second. So does that, that's, quick question, does the frozen fish have as much nutritional value as a fresh fish you might be eating? Absolutely, it's, that's absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up because let's compare that to our frozen vegetable story, right? Uh, example, in, in some cases you might be better off depending on what your fishmonger's like, where you're getting your fish from, you may be better off with the frozen because it's, it's caught, it's processed, it's packaged, and it's flash frozen. So not that, they're, not that it's going to last in your freezer forever, but it might be better than an option of, you don't really know your fishmonger, you don't really know how long that fish has been hanging around in the counter. And I, I tend to see I'm a glass half full kind of person, so I don't go to the dark side of things. But unfortunately, we've heard of stories of marketers and fishmongers covering the smell of fish with a, a bad smell of fish that's not quite that fresh um, with certain um, deodorizers. So in some cases, it, it may be better than you know, fresh, depending on where you buy your fish. I, 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 rem I remember in, in, in my youth, you know, we lived next to Sheepset Bay uh, in Coney Island, and the uh, they had this guy that came up, he had a truck. In the back of the truck, like a pickup, was ice, and he packed fish. So in the morning, he'd go over to Sheepset Bay to buy the fresh catch. And then in the mornings or the afternoons, he'd be in the different neighborhoods. So we always had fresh fish, and that was great. 
Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, fresh fish, first of all, taste amazing. Um, but again, I, I, I always have to layer in price and accessibility. Um, so again, I'm just trying to present options. Um, but clearly, if you can get fresh fish, um, it's it, it's uh, it's pretty top notch. Um, so. Go ahead, did you have a question, Maxine? No? no, I was just thinking of the movie Coda somehow. Coda? Uh, Coda, the movie that won the Academy Award. It's all about uh, fresh it, fish, it, right? It, it's about, no, it's, a, well, the story's great and, and fish fishing is a big part of it. Yeah. So uh, you could see on the boat what they do and how they work on prices. So it gives you, kind of gives you a little history, a little idea of how the markets work. That, that, I don't know, it just came to my No, brain. no. So let's jump right into that. I'll talk about the, um, the, the sort of the organic fish, US, the, the standards that are out there that'll help consumers. But you're right. There are many different ways to, you can either fish, you know, we either consider fish like you know, off of a boat. Uh, there are different methods to actually catch the fish. And then there's farmed fish. Right, so I want you to think about your wild fish, obviously the fish that are caught in their natural habitat, yeah? And then your farmed fish are in large, large tanks. Now, right away people say, and I know where most people's heads go, wild, always great, farmed, always awful. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. We are becoming increasingly more aware as a society, as a culture, that not only traditional farmed fish practices need to change for greater sustainability um, to make sure we're not overfishing certain populations and affecting you know, the environment, the ecosystem of the water, but we're also looking at from a wild seafood perspective, how we're catching those fish. And I don't know if they touched on that, I haven't seen the movie, um, but there's a significant problem with something called bycatch. Are you guys familiar with that? Yep. They have a big, yeah, they, they put out, you know, these, these giant, giant nets and they just, I mean, they, they, they're just literally making fishing population, the fish population is, is dwindling because now they can, you used to go on a boat and back in the day, fish, whatever, but now they, they use these other methods that, and by, it's crazy. Right, so those are called trawling nets. Um, right, mm -hmm. that's even long line. Um, the the good news is is that there's an awareness of this, particularly within the United States, to try and fix some of this um, to lessen some of this bycatch. So it's not just overfishing, but unfortunately, it's the unintended consequence of pulling in fish aside from what you're trying to catch. So you'll, you might get, you know, turtles, or you might get other things. And so they're aware of this and they're trying as much as they can. It, it may be a slow wheel turning, but at least it's turning in the right direction to try and improve some of these technologies. So for example, I'll give you a small, I was researching this uh, for long line fishing, for example, simply moving, and this is economically feasible. And that's important because you have to make sure that these fisheries are able to implement these processes that you're recommended, right, recommending so that they can af afford this and meet the needs, these sustainability needs. Simply by switching from a J hook to a circle hook um, is impactful because what they're seeing is that it's less damaging to the bycatch and you can actually throw them back in without the, the, the J hooks are easily swallowed, they get lodged. So something small like that is a move in the right direction. So I simply bring this up because I, I think people like nobody's paying any attention. It's there's an awareness. Um, there are great resources for people who are trying to research this a little bit more. Um, the, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. So you guys have heard, anybody who follows me know um, that I talk about the Dirty Dozen List, the Envir Environmental Working Group, to use that to help drive your purchases of organic foods. Um, I, I liken this um, list to that um, to that list of vegetables. This is a great guide. They have a fantastic app. I would encourage you to download it, or you can kick it old school and simply pick up. A lot of fishmongers and grocery stores have these available. Um, it's a little seafood watch list, and it basically has categorized from best choices down to avoids. They have it available nationally, and they have it available regionally too. 
So you can click on for Southeast, Northeast, West Coast, but the national list will give you, um, and it's usually updated fairly regularly. So you can look there as a consumer and say, you know what? And you can, if you've got the app, you basically plug in the name of the fish that you're trying to purchase and it will tell you where it sits in that list. And I think that's helpful in terms of reducing your purchasing of over potentially an overfished population, um, but also how is it being, you know, how, where did it come from? Is it, is it really susceptible to bycatch? What are their practices like? And I will tell you that it's not always a wild versus farmed decision. They're making great strides in farmed fishing to make it more of a sustainable approach. Because remember, bycatch is normally fish in their habitat wild. So there is, you need to look at that in terms of, you know, okay, wild is not, is, is you know, a great choice, but that's what we're seeing a lot. We're seeing a lot of these issues with the bycatch. So it's a great guide in terms of what can I get? What's a better choice um, for, uh, for me, for the environment, and, and for overall purchasing power. So I highly recommend if you are somebody who eats seafood to either download the app, download the list, doesn't really matter and use it as a resource. It's fantastic. So there's one resource, a reference um, of that. And I'll have this when I post, go ahead. I have a question. I have a eating fish. Wait, Malcolm, wait, wait. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go I'll over go. you on this. I'm going over you on this. I, I don't know, you know, all this is great. Fish is very healthy. It's part of the blue zone. It's part of all these great diets. I'm not a fish person, but that's me. What, what from, from of late reading about it, uh, I'm concerned about the plastics and the mercury and things that are in the fish as a result of pollution in the waters. And it's really something that you have to address. I know they say, you know, pregnant women shouldn't eat certain fishes, you know, uh, you know, is what is your take on all of that? Uh, well, let's start with that. So certainly it's been well known that particularly the young, very young children, people with suppressed immune function, pregnant women should avoid those fish. They're typically very large fish. So orange roughy, swordfish, tilefish, um, that uh, Ch uh, Chilean sea bass, that have uh, beyond the acceptable you know, parts per million levels of mercury in the actual flesh of the fish. So they should be cautious of what they're consuming. It's still, you can still eat other types of fish, absolutely, but they would be wise to limit their consumption of those high, typically mercury containing uh, fish. Um, having said that, there are many others that are not um, high in, in mercury. So I think it's a wise thing to do. And you're right, Maxine, you know, we got to work. There's a lot of moving parts here. Mm -hmm. What about uh, sushi, uh, raw fish for, for certain people? Is that, yeah. you know, certain people have to be careful, you know, what they're consuming and raw fish is kind of one of those things. So right. from a health perspective, you, you have to, you know, the, you have to know what you can eat. I, I assume, you know, that there's many really good fishes, but the raw fish, I'm uh, not sure. Well, I have to tell you, know, and, and, and what I would, my response to that would be, let's look to those populations of people who eat raw fish on a regular basis. And I will tell you that if you looked at the data, there is no greater risk of foodborne illness in that population than there is um, in people who eat completely cooked fish. So we've got to go to that. Having said that, I think it's important to know that just like we, what Malcolm and I were talking about fish, I, I would never run the risk of trying to do sushi in my own house. I don't have that much faith in my ability to do it safely, move that quickly, because you can't leave, like I'm already panicking. You saw me, you guys saw me before we started. <laughs> right. the fridge. It's going right back in afterwards. You've gotta be careful. So know where you are purchasing uh, your, if you're having you know, sushi, I'm just bringing that up because it's typically raw fish on um, sashimi. Um, if you're in a restaurant, um, know the restaurant where you're getting it and, you know, or cook the fish to an appropriate level. I think people who are immune suppressed going through chemotherapy on treatments that really are suppressing their ability to fight off infection, my general safety advice would be you might want to avoid raw fish or quite frankly, any undercooked uh, animal product or quite frankly, any under rinsed or under washed vegetables during that period because of the inherent risk of bacterial or viral contamination. 
Mm. I'll so, add one more. Don't eat sushi or don't buy sushi from a gas station. That's yeah. the big issue. Well, I mean, no, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a bad idea. So um, let me talk a little bit because I, you know, I got my fish today, and I think it's important for consumers to know because fish can be expensive. You know, with, there are other lower cost options, certainly. Currently, there are no standards set, organic standards set for seafood within the United States. It falls outside of all the other um, national organic um, program foods, so vegetables, fruits, meats, milk. There is no carve out currently. They are working on these standards right now. The USDA is developing organic aquaculture standards, but they're not in practice yet. So if you go into a grocery store or into your fishmonger, and I will say fishmongers are a little bit, so a standalone, when I mean fishmonger, I mean a standalone fish store, seafood store, you are less likely to see an organic label in the fish. Because right now you're technically not supposed to have it labeled organic because it's a little bit of um, mislabeling. So any organic in quotes, I'll put that any organic fish or seafood, the uh, seafood that you might be getting is in all likelihood from outside of the country, which is not, is not always bad, but we don't follow necessarily their standards and you've got nothing really to validate that claim that it's organic and people pay big money for that label. So it's really just sort of an FYI, know where you're buying your fish from, question where it is. By law, every piece of um, seafood, shellfish, or um, uh, regular fish that you see inside that casing has to list country of origin. Now that's going to be helpful because it goes back to that list I was telling you about because you need to know where uh, the fish, the seafood is coming from in order to gauge where it sits in this particular list. So look for those things in the casing get to know and have an open conversation. I've had very frank conversations with my grocery store fishmonger um, and without necessarily posting a big sign, he's been able to sort of give me like the wink, like you might not want to buy this today. And mm. I know that means mm -mm. <laughs> right. another day. So don't be afraid to ask, make yourself aware. Please don't fall into the trap of if it's organic, because like I said, I know that's very, very expensive. Right now, we've got no standards. So I'm not sure really what that labeling means right now. And be mindful of the, the wild versus farmed. You know, farmed trout is continually on the best practices, best choice, um, according, to this, uh, according to this group. On the other side, um, wild caught halibut is continually on the please avoid so again, don't make it always a, a, a wild versus farmed decision. Make it an informed decision based on what um, your preference, not only your preferences, but what these governing bodies, these things that we can look to right now, let that help you drive your decision. Right. I heard til tilapia is a fish that's farmed a lot and there's like mixed things on tilapia. So I don't, you know, I don't know since I don't eat it, uh, what, what, what the difference is. So I, I'm, did you hear about anything about tilapia being farmed and how? Um, well, I'm looking at this right now. And this was, I printed this one out, but I, I usually, uh, the app is actually much more current because it's real time. And then right now the tilapia, it does not say whether this one's the wild or farmed, but it's on the good alternatives and it gives us specific countries. Um, where you should, that's where that country of origin is going to be helpful. Um, I suppose you can always ask your fishmonger, um, is this wild or is it, they're usually fairly quick to tell you whether it's wild or farmed, but. The, yeah. the tilapia generally is the, from what I say in the seafood is generally the least expensive of any of the fish. Right. I mean, it's very economic. Very economic. And I think people, again, just like with the canned fishes, where people turn their noses up to that, um, I think many folk turn their nose up to tilapia as well, whether that's fair or not. Um, I will leave that to people's, you know, decisions. But I think it's been, in, from my perspective, a little unfair because it can be, like you said, a great way to get fish on the table that uh, doesn't necessarily crush you know, the bank account. So, um, so yeah, lots to think about. Maybe I mean, from the books, I, from the books I'm reading uh, about fish, that that the uh, the, the, the what the omega six omega three three I mean it's three. Mm -hmm. so good for the brain. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And, and, and they're encouraging people to eat more fish. Right. Uh, so the guideline, yeah, you're right, Mount, it's like two to two to three servings a week. And again, that can be omega-3 fish, uh, containing fish. We've mentioned those before, but it can don't don't exclude the ones that are not necessarily. But yeah, you're high. And again, canned don't canned salmon is a great option. So, but some people really don't like any of the fatty fishes that are high in omega-3. It is such a great um, essential fatty acid to include in your diet. It's called essential because remember, we can't make it on our own. So it must come from external sources, what you're eating um, or what you're drinking. So you either need to get it in your food like these fatty fish, or you can get it from the foods that the fish eat. So think seaweeds, algae, things like that, but not many people are sitting down, at least in our country, to a ginormous bowl of you know, seaweed on a regular basis, much easier to get the dose you need from fatty fish, or even things like flaxseed, pumpkin seeds, walnuts, we've discussed those before. But well, well, yeah. Is kelp seaweed? Yeah, yes. Kelp, because that's yeah. what they wrap the sushi in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. But again, you're not you're not eating a ton. Maybe you are, and maybe some people do. You know, but it's not usually um, a, a big food element that will help you meet that omega three need. Right. So, so me not being a fish eater, I have to eat those nuts or eat seaweed. <laughs> Is there any other option? Um, there is an option. So for you, yeah, for complete non-fish eaters. So no fins, whatever in their no world. Fins. No like fins. To, I only like to look at the fins, not eat the fins. You're like my pop. No fins mm -hmm. for him either. So yeah, so you can eat any of the plant version, very similar. So the seaweeds we just mentioned, you want to talk about the chia seed, walnuts, pumpkin seeds are great options. And um, you can also supplement um, with omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA, just those two. You don't need the, you don't need the omega-9s in it, the omega-6s in it. We get enough of that in the American diet. So I would, I would probably consider looking into that, assuming your healthcare provider is okay. Because remember, if there's an impact in the body, you want to make sure that he or she's giving you the all clear. So right. that's not interfering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, you have to be uh, very mindful and you have to educate yourself so yeah. you know what you're eating and what, I mean, people love fish, which is great. You, you both love fish. I just, I don't know. I never developed a taste. And believe me, I've been, I've been shamed at the table many times in a restaurant. Uh, you know, they tried, they tried. It just didn't, didn't work. <laughs> I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you a little gift bag of all the, like, I'm going to get you chia seeds, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds. It's all going to be a seed fest for you. <laughs> I don't mind seeds. Seeds is, seed, seed. I like seeds, but this other stuff, I just can't, I don't know. Never just develop that taste. There's always one in the crowd and it's usually me. So. Oh gosh. Yeah, well, so well, it, it's funny, Chris, you know, being raised, again, being raised Jewish in New York, everybody loved locks. Uh, yeah. and, and I never liked locks until when I came to Los Angeles and I was looking for a job. So part-time job, I was a, a captain in a French restaurant. And one of the gourmet things I had, you had this big salmon that you had to cut. And, and you know, to me, it was smoked salmon, but to me, it's locks. Yeah. And all the other uh, waiters and uh, busboys used to love the locks. That was their... their uh, you know, piece de resistance, they, they, you know, they cut a slice and, and put it, you know, hide it away. So they ate it after they served it. <laughs> so do you like it now? Now I love it. Okay. You, taste, bud, taste buds change, Maxine. There's hope for you yet. <laughs> no, kidding. there is no hope. Yeah, Max, I, I will see lox and bagels and white fish and all that stuff on a table at a <laughs> Sunday thing. And it's like, nope, it ain't happening. Uh, I'll, I go to a completely different, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not, I just don't. And, and strangely enough, I, I mean, I think my brothers ate maybe some fish like sole or, or one of those, you know, less, and my dad would eat salmon and so right. I'm the only one, I guess, in my family, my immediate family that, right. nope. So, yeah, and then a lot of it is, is how it's prepared. 
I was just going to say that, Malcolm, is sometimes with how it's prepared, um, in many cases, I uh, if people are very sensitive to smells, because let's face it, um, even the freshest fish while you're cooking yeah. it, is, you know, maybe cooking it outside so it's not in the house. Um, I think that um, shellfish like shrimp, they have this, I mean, they're basically, it takes on the flavor of pretty much anything that you're seasoning it with is wonderful. And just a word about that, because I know people still are hearing that shellfish are, are high in cholesterol. So I know I'm, I feel like you're, you're giving us the hook soon, Malcolm, so I'm going to wrap it up. So it's fine as long as you're not sitting down to, you know, you know, shellfish every single day for three meals a day. Shellfish is an absolute fine part of a healthful diet even for people who have high cholesterol levels. It's oddly high in cholesterol, but it has no saturated fat. And studies have shown that it doesn't have an adverse effect on cholesterol levels. So you feel comfortable having it if you like it. And it's, and it's not kosher. <laughs> it's not, no, it's not kosher. No, no I, we haven't served shrimp on Passover yet. However, well, one caveat to me not eating fish, there is a little, a little room there. I have on occasion, if I go to a, you know, like a Benihana type place yeah. and they make the, the, the shrimp on that grill and it yeah. doesn't taste or smell fishy. And yeah, I dip it in the sauce because it kind of disguises it. Okay. And so I've had shrimp and my, oh, and my oh, redheaded oh, friend's brother used to call me shrimp boat. So, cause I'm so tall. So uh, Max on that note, let's give us a uh, wrap. We're doing a wrap, okay? Definitely. So you'll be able, you'll be able to get more information. I'll tell you where. So thanks for joining us for Courtney on Health. To get more info, follow Courtney on her Facebook page, which is Courtney on Health, on Instagram at CLG Wellness, and visit her website CourtneyRevenies.com. For more shows, go to MalcolmPresents.com and the Many Shades of Green.com. Uh, so please drop us a line and let us know any questions you have. Uh, so we have now Courtney on health, smart, sound nutrition, strong, safe fitness, and we'll catch you again next time. Right. <laughs> Drop us a line, right? Bye. Drop us a line. <laughs> See you next week. Bye. <laughs>